Good morning, Booktube YouTube. <clears throat> this is Johnny. <clears throat> I know I made a video last night or yesterday, but I was sitting here as I do in the mornings. It, it is Friday, September the 23rd. It is 6.52 in the morning. I got up at 10 to 6 this morning. I bet I used to get up really early for years and then when I started sleeping down the lower level I started sleeping maybe to 7 o'clock. Sometimes I'd sleep to 7.30 but the last couple of days I've been getting up really early. Uh, my wife, she gets up really early. Sometimes she gets up at 4, 5, sometimes she sleeps to 6.20. But as you know, as I mentioned yesterday, my wife is with a couple of girlfriends, they went up north, a couple of hours and north to stay overnight with a friend. And uh, so she's not here this morning. So in the mornings when I get up, usually my wife is sitting in the living room having devotions. My wife has, she reads to the Bible and she looks at, um, she prays for all the people and, um, in her church, they're going through trials or sickness, or um, she prays for missionaries and churches and ministries and family and friends, and prays for the spreading of the gospel and things like that. And uh, what I do is, as you know, is I read. <clears throat> I've been reading Dionysus and the Carthusian <clears throat> on the Psalms, and then I've been reading the Reformation commentary on Second Corinthians. I'm, uh, I'm, I've read almost 289 pages. I'm on First Corinthians chapter 10, 1 through 18. And uh, so I read that in the morning, and I write in my diary, or I wrote in my diary a little bit. I'm on page 897 for the year 2022. I also, uh, when I'm reading through Second Corinthians, I read the second letter to the Corinthians. This is a commentary by Mark A. Sitfred, and this was published not that long ago, uh, 2014. This is the Pillar New Testament commentary series, and uh, I like this series. I don't have every single one of them, but um, I have the one on Ephesians by Peter T. O'Brien. I think I have the Hebrews one by Peter T. O'Brien and James. I had I don't have every single one of them. <clears throat> the one on John by D. A. Carson. I have these um, these books on the the life of the Apostle Paul and my main study over there. And this is Paul, Apostle of God's Glory in Christ, a Pauline theology by Thomas. R. Schneider, and this is really good to read if you want to know the theology of the Apostle Paul. Uh, highly recommend it. It's also now in, <clears throat> in paperback, this volume. I also recommend this book, Apostle Paul, His Life and Theology by Udell Chanel. It's good uh, when you're, it's like, I've mentioned over the years in my videos that when I read a novel, I like reading the biography of the writer who wrote the novel. Uh, and so, um, so when you read the New Testament, especially the Pauline epistles, it's good to read about the life of the Apostle Paul. And, um, uh, 
and, fi and find, uh, like when you look at uh, Schneider's Paul, the Apostle of God's glory in Christ, he looks at um, introduction, the centrality of God in Christ in Paul's theology, proclaiming a magnificent God, the Pauline mission, the base of mission, the fulfillment of the promise to Abraham. For, chapter 4, suffering and the Pauline mission, the means of spreading the gospel. Five, dishonoring God, the violation, the violation of God's law. Six, dishonoring God, the power of sin. Seven, the person of Jesus Christ, the exaltation of Christ for the glory of God. Chapter eight, God's saving righteousness, the base of a right relationship with God. Nine, God's liberating work for his people, divine transforming grace. <clears throat> Chapter 10, living to the honor of God, living to honor God, the power to live a new life. Chapter 11, faith and hope, the ground of perseverance. Chapter 12, life of love in the spirit, exhortations in the law in Paul. Chapter 13, the, spirit, the church and spiritual gifts, the unity of God's people. Chapter 4, the ordinances of the church and its ministry. The building up of the body. Chapter 15, the social war world of the new community, living as Christians in the culture. Chapter 16, the hope of God's people, the fulfillment of God's saving purposes. So it's really, I really recommend it. This one is more, uh, does the same thing, but from a different perspective. So I recommend these. So when you get up in the morning, <coughs> as I mentioned, we have devotions. Now, why do we do that? Well, as I mentioned in my videos, I can't really face each day without Christ. I mean, the more I, as I get older and older and I realize that life is so temporal and so fleeting, I have come, especially since last summer when I had that that uh, collapse, that um, I need God every day. And the only way I can keep going is keeping a line of communication, living a life of uh, a real true prayer and reading God's Word and that's why I get up in the morning and I uh, I write my diary and I read the Reformation commentary on Second Corinthians and I read on the Psalms and my wife and I we read Paul David Tripp uh, the New Morning Mercies a daily gospel devotional and something we read yesterday that I thought I'd read because it might help those who are out there uh, and it really spoke to me and I thought I'd just read it to you it's September the 22nd and it goes like this there is no need to be paralyzed by the opinion of opinions of another God gives you the ultimate tool of self-assessment the mirror of his word it it was a 12 page long, then the devotional goes, it was 12 pages long, the kind of letter no one really wants to get. I didn't want to read it, but I knew I had to. She took me apart like a cor coroner doing an autopsy. Each paragraph was like a knife cutting into a different organ, searching for disease. The judgment was harsh and unrelenting. The examples of my failures in her eyes were many. There was little grace to be found in those 12 pages. When I got to the end of the letter, I felt that there was nothing left of me. I sat at my desk, stunned. I was her pastor, but she had no respect for me whatsoever. I couldn't believe what I had read, and I was paralyzed by the thought that others felt the same way. I felt. I felt glued to the seat, unable to move, without strength to continue. The next morning was worse. I woke up with a knot in the pit of my stomach. I wanted to run and to quit. 
Now, no opinions of people should have that power, but often they do. Without knowing it, we put our identity and inner peace in the hands of the people around us. We look to them for what no flawed human being will ever be able to deliver. We ride the roller coaster of their views of us. We begin to do things not because they are right, but because we know that they will please those whose opinion of us and acceptance of us means more than they should. I think fear of man is a bigger motivation for many of us than we tend to admit. The gospel of Jesus Christ frees us from this. First and foremost, it presents to us the only reliable standard of self-evaluation, the perfect mirror of the Word of God. Then it frees us, it, then it frees me from seeking my identity horizontally because I'm given an eternal identity in Christ. It also frees me from being worried about being known or exposed because I know that nothing could ever be exposed about me that hasn't already been ex covered by the precious blood of Jesus. Further, it allows me to be approachable when people bring things to me that I need to hear and evaluate. I can do this because I know I'm a sinner. I know that the grace that has been given to me is greater than all my sin. Finally, I am not worried ab about or haunted by what you think of me because I don't look to you for my inner sense of well-being. No matter how little I am appreciated by those around me, no matter how little I am understood, no matter how little I am loved, no matter how little respect comes my ways, I go to bed in peace knowing that the one person who counts knows me thoroughly, but he will never turn his back on me even in the light of his complete knowledge of my sin. Weaknesses and failures. No, now that's a reality that can free you from your, your bondage to the opinions of others. For further study and encouragement, read John chapter 16, verse 32. So that really spoke to me because over the years, I mean, if when you go to prayer and you go before God, you see how sinful you are, how much you failed, how much you have not lived up to the glory of God. But what is so comforting and so blessed to know that Jesus' blood covers all my sins and that I am not saved by my works. I'm not saved by anything that I do. I'm saved by the work of Christ who died on the cross for me. And that you know you can look in you can look at your in, inward all the time and just feel terrible. Because if you're completely honest as a Christian, you see that you sin in thought, word, and deed. And so what you have to do is that you have to rest in the finished work of Christ. You have to go and appropriate by faith that forgiveness of sins, that your sins have been covered by the blood of Christ, that, you are, that when you were saved, that you were united to Christ by the Holy Spirit. And that God declares you righteous because of what Christ accomplished on the cross. That he died for your sins. He suffered the wrath of God for your sins. And they've been appeased, propitiated. And God accepts that sacrifice of the death of Christ. That he took my place and he suffered the wrath of God for my sins. And now I can receive because of his divine obedience, I can receive righteousness, the righteousness of the law that he, that we, that are, is imputed to us, the imputed righteousness of Christ. So that, that's really comforting because the, as you get older, you're going to face death. <laughs> and what's going to, when you come to that hour, that you're going to die, that you're going to stand before a holy God. It's a blessed knowledge knowing that you will stand before God in the day of judgment, clothed with the righteousness of Christ. Anyway, I also 
one thing I wanted to talk about too is that when after we read Paul Tripp and Carol reads the Bible selection, we pray. And I find, you know, Carol is, is a, can really pray because she has all these things that she prays for, as I've said in the minute ago. But when I come to God in prayer, there's I always notice within myself this hesitancy. I have a very difficult time approaching God in prayer. And I often ask myself, why? And I, I think it's just, I don't know what to pray. <laughs> uh, I usually come to God with pain within my inner being, a, a, a pain, because I can't express what I want to say to God. I don't know how to, the words. I'm coming before God who's all-knowing, who's holy, who's my Heavenly Father. I'm coming, I'm approaching this throne of grace with thankfulness that I can wake up each day and and know Him, I can read His Word. I have, I live in a very quiet, peaceful neighborhood. I'm not living in Ukraine. I'm not living in Puerto Rico where people have lost everything in that hurricane. I'm not living in Mexico City where there's just an earthquake. I'm not living in North Korea under dictatorship. I'm not living in a slum in some city in Brazil. I'm not living in India on the streets starving with sacred cows wandering all around. I'm living in this very quiet Midwest town, plenty of food, books, paper, health care. So I come before God with thanksgiving and just humble, I'm just humbled by His goodness. But one thing I do read in the mornings is Jay, Jay's family prayers. And Friday morning he says, Our voice shall hear in the morning, O Lord, in the morning alone in our family. We will direct our prayer unto thee and will look up. How well does it become us to be thankful? Many during the past night have had no place where to lay their head. Many of the victims of disease have been full of tossing to and fro into the dawning of the day so that their bed has not comforted them nor their couch ease their complaint. Many have been deprived of rest while watching over their con connections in pain and sorrow. How many have slept the sleep of death and will not awake till the heavens are no more. Others whose lives are prolonged have risen to be surrounded with want and woe. And thousands who have all things richly to enjoy have risen only to live another day without God in the world. That's a horrible thing, to live every day in this world without God. That to me is just absolutely tragic. He goes on, and, and why is it, and why is not this the case with us? Thou, O God, has remembered and distinguished and indulged us. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless thy holy name. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. And thy mercies have been new every morning and every moment. All thy desires have not been gratified, but it was love that denied us when the accomplishment of our wishes, wishes would have proved our ruin or our injury. We have had our trials, but they have been few compared with our sins. They have been attended with numberless alleviations when we have kissed the rod it has fallen out of thy hand thou hast often wiped away tears and restored peace to thy mourners thou hast never chastened us but for our profit we already see the design of many of our griefs and can say it is good for me that i have been afflicted 
and other cases where darkness yet clouds the dis dispensation, we desire to walk by faith. But we believe that thou hast done all things well, and that thy work is perfect. But oh, what do we owe thee for the word of thy truth, the throne of thy grace, the son of thy love, thy unspeakable gift? What do we owe thee if we have any reason to hope that we are in Christ, and free from all condemnation? And that when he who is our life shall appear, we shall also appear with him in glory and be forever with the Lord. And that's what, you, and that's what I keep before me today. That I am in Christ and I'm free from all condemnation. And that when he comes again, the, the second coming of Christ, who is our life shall appear. We shall also appear with him in glory and be forever with the Lord. That's what sustains me in this world. It is being torn apart by hatred and war, phantom and drought and hurricanes and hatred and all matter of evil. He who is our life shall appear and we shall also appear with him in glory and be forever with the Lord. Surely a gratitude becomes us that will not evaporate in a morning acknowledgement with the lips, but such as will keep us in the fear of the Lord all day long, and lead us to ask, What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits towards me? We therefore, by the mercies of God, present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto thee with our reasonable service. So I thought I'd just share these thoughts with you this morning. That's what I do. I thought about reading the Valley of Vision. This is a good devotional too. Uh, the Valley of Vision is, the full title is, I've read this for years, The Valley of Vision, Collection of Puritan Prayers and Devotions, edited by Arthur Bennett. So I hope you have a good day, a good, a good Friday. This is a good weekend. Thank you for your comments. To pray you have a good reading weekend, seek the Lord, live a life of prayer, read the Word of God, read the book of Psalms, read the Bible, seek the Lord while He may be found, because there is no second chance after you die. The, when you die, then the judgment. So, once again, have a good weekend, and until next time, Bye.